So we're very lucky to have here Matthew Bishop, who is the U.S. business editor and New York bureau chief of The Economist. He was the business editor in London, and he's a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council and Role of Business. Uh, he has a co-author, Michael Green, whom I'm sure he would want me to mention, Absolutely. with whom he's written several books, and he wrote Philanthropic Capitalism. Um, and has done such an intimidating list of special reports for The Economist that those of us journalists who know what it takes to write and assemble these special reports, for example, Kings of Capitalism, uh, The Collapse of Enron, um, Watching the Boss in 1994. Um, and he was on the faculty of London Business School, so he comes with an intimidating set of credentials. But I was going to ask, when you got the idea of writing a book about the changes in uh, philanthropy and how you coined the term philanthropic capitalism, which should trip off all our tongues by the end of this session? <laughs> well, I mean, the, the original uh, interest in philanthropy came when I wrote a special report on uh, the new wealth that was being created during the last 20 years of the, the last century and how that was changing um, how the wealth creators themselves felt about the world and how society operated. And in the course of that, I, I guess, I was struck by how many people who had uh, been successful entrepreneurs were finding themselves mu uh, really focusing on, on giving back, giving in interesting ways that they hadn't expected to be able to do. And that this was something they were far more passionate about, really, than talking about their, how they made the money in the first place. And, and, and in the course of that, I interviewed Bill Gates for the first time and was just astonished at how, um, you know, how, how passionate he was about um, how this philanthropy was going to change his life by giving him the chance to really make a difference in, and perhaps save millions of lives through his giving. And I, I, I went away thinking this is a big deal um, and tried to persuade the economists for five years to let me write a special report specifically on the new wave of giving which they finally did about three months before Warren Buffett uh, made his big announcement at the uh, New York Public Library that he was giving away most of his money. And I was there in the audience that day, and it just struck me that this was a unique moment in human history. The two most successful business people of, the, of, of our age, and perhaps any age, um, standing there pledging to give away the vast and bulk of their fortune, and to do it to solve some of the most intractable problems of poverty and uh, in the education system in the United States. Um, and it just, I, I wanted to know how this moment had come to be. Um, was this an exception or part of a broader trend, which I find it is part of a broader trend? And can they actually achieve what are incredibly difficult goals, which I think is the, the question we really care most about, um, with Warren Buffett at that day saying, you know, this is much, giving money away effectively is much harder than making money in the first place. You know, these are really tough problems and can individuals as opposed to governments really um, find solutions to, to these long-term, deep, big problems? And were you finding that this kind of approach, well, I'd like you to take us back. One of the fascinations of uh, Mr. Bishop's book, and I hope you're all going to buy it, is that it talks about the history of world philanthropy and the idea that it was people who had you know, lofty goals or had very specific politically and business-minded driven goals. So what were some of the examples in history that struck you as being particularly influential now? Well, what we found, which, which I was surprised by as we look back at the history of philanthropy, is that we've probably, since modern capitalism began, had about five golden ages of philanthropy, starting in the Middle Ages with the first sort of mercantile traders who were very big on endowing schools and um, hospitals. And then subsequently, once you had the creation of the joint stock company in uh, Holland and the UK in the early 18th century, you, you saw almost the invention of joint stock philanthropy where the social entrepreneurs of their day would actually get 100 people to subscribe to their organization and, uh, and fund it. Um, but am I completely wrong? So there, was, there were these you know, amazing periods where it seemed like the successes in capitalism, it seems to be that a certain number of them will apply their whatever skills made them successful in business to solving whatever the social problem 
of the day is. So this isn't a unique moment. It's, it may be a return to a, to a history. And, and, and America's first golden age was with Carnegie and, and Rockefeller and so forth. What's the trajectory between the guilds of the Middle Ages in which capitalists pooled their money, right, to, to endow hospitals and schools, and then Andrew Carnegie, who is an individual who decides on a set of goals? Well, I mean, I think some of the, 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 the mercantile people in the, in the Middle Ages would also have been individual uh, actors as well. I mean, you see a lot of the schools and buildings of, of, of continental Europe and England with names on them, which is, the, is, a, is a key indicator. But I mean, I think that as Carnegie came along, he, he really was the first to realize you had to, in, you, you had, he had more wealth to give away than he was ever gonna be able to give away on his own in his lifetime. And so he set up the institutional form and endowed it of, of the foundation, which we now have um, a lot of. Do you mean there weren't individually begun foundations in the U.S. before Carnegie? There were a few, but nothing that was endowed with you know, the equivalent of billions of dollars um, that was going to go on for a very long period of time. And what about the history of um, shaming by example that Carnegie was awfully good at uh, by saying, if you don't follow these ideals, you have not made your money for any higher good and you should not be dying with any. When does that start, that idea? I mean, is that particularly Presbyterian? I think it is quite Presbyterian. I mean, it's, uh, and there's always been a, a culture of you know, religious duty to give and so forth, which he was very much shaped by. But I think he took it further in that he was very concerned, and I guess it's a concern that's reawakening today with the Piketty analysis and so forth around inequality, that if the rich, the successful people didn't uh, invest in the sustainability of society by looking after the needs of the poor and giving poorer people the best chance they could to succeed, then communism or whatever would, ta would take over. And so that, that was a big part of his message. And he, so not only was he shaming other rich people on the basis of if you die rich, you die disgraced, if you haven't given away your money. Um, he was also saying that this is in your self-interest as a, as a believer in capitalism. And he, was, he had a sort of social Darwinist view of the world, that the, the people who did succeed did so on merit. Um, he said, if you believe in that, then you, you know that the people that didn't succeed, to some extent, didn't succeed on merit. Um, but your duty is to keep them happy in some sense and keep them busy and, and give back and make sure they have fulfilling lives which I'm not sure is a view that we would take today, but, it's a, but I think the underlying message that um, philanthropy can be an important part of the response to the, the Piketty analysis and the, the sense that um, a lot of people have that we're, getting, we're moving to a world ruled by the 1% and that that's a bad thing, um, I, mean, I think is, is, is very relevant today. Can you talk about what you have made of Piketty, which the Atlantic's website has devoted reams of space to, I, everyone has, whether you think it's something that should make philanthropists of today particularly anxious, and also, when you say that Carnegie was responding to the precursor of the Piketty idea of inequality, was he actually aiming to level society or bring disequity closer together and have a more level playing field. And is that a goal that you think you will start seeing philanthropists have today? Yeah, up to a point. I mean, I think clearly during his lifestyle, his life, I mean, there, there was a sense in which he was a, he and his class were a wealthy group, although he was probably a more austere person in how he lived his Famously. life. But, you know, I think that he certainly didn't believe that there should be a hereditary uh, class that would uh, continue to dominate for generations. Um, he was very much shaped by uh, looking at the British experience, continental European experience, and seeing that as a very bad, a bad, bad result of wealth creation. And so he did want um, a very meritocratic society and saw philanthropy as part of the creation of that. And I think that's very much what's going on today. I mean, Bill Gates is interesting in that he will never talk about the duty to give or would never use the kind of Carnegie language around you're disgraced if you don't do it. For him, it's very much about how good it makes you feel to give and that you really can solve big problems, and that's a fantastic thing to be able to be part of. But I think he does have a very much a view that you, you want to invest in giving people a good chance in life and, and to 
make society better for everyone. And so that is, a, is an egalitarian mission, mission up to a point. And can you contrast more the history of US philanthropy as it begins with Carnegie as a kind of reaction to what he saw as the European class system and primogenitor? Um, and is that, has that had an influence across Europe? And then we'll talk about other parts of the world that might or might not be influencing. Well, I mean, in a, in a funny sort of way, I mean, in Europe, because they didn't buy the Carnegie message so much, you, you probably didn't have the kind of um, investment in tackling some of the problems that were, were affecting society that, um, that America did at the start of the 20th century in building up some of the great institutions uh, that the philanthropists held, helped develop. Um, and Europe did get socialism and it did get um, communism and, 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 and it had two world wars. And out of that, you do have people that have a lot of wealth and a lot of that is inherited wealth. Um, and they have been very reluctant to be public about philanthropy in a way that um, is still very normal in, in America and becoming more so. Is that simple classy discretion or fear? No, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of fear underlying it that if you put your head above the radar, above the wall, you will, um, you will be shot at in some sense. Either the tax man will come calling or you will um, have your money confiscated in some other way. And I guess the Piketty analysis again, it seemed to me what was interesting about that was not that he provided compelling evidence that the 1% are getting richer and richer relative to the average. I think we all knew that. But that it's had such a political response in that it suddenly seems to have provided a lot of people in the mainstream of politics with um, a populist uh, excuse to, to, sort of, to advocate a whole bunch of policies that in some ways, seeing how it goes, could reverse 30 years of pro-market policies that, or start to see some backtracking on those at least. Do you have any idea, Piketty has made such a uh, wave in this, in this country, but do you see that since you are often in England and you know about Europe, do you see that happening now in Europe and do you think that philanthropists in Europe felt that they were kind of off the hook because social policies had been trying to equalize society so why should they have to bother? Yeah, I mean, I think to some extent, if you're a German philanthropist, your focus is going to be probably outside of Germany or on, or on some very new breaking issue that is not covered by the German welfare state because that is such a comprehensive uh, system that, that, that there isn't a lot of uh, opportunity for the traditional type of American philanthropy. Um, so, so they do feel to some extent you know, they pay their taxes, they, they do the right thing, They've, their ancestors gave a lot of their wealth back to the state, and therefore um, the state has a duty to sort out a lot of these problems. I think that's starting to change because um, there are huge problems like what you do with um, older people and the fact that dementia is becoming a big challenge to all um, aging developed societies and the existing healthcare system doesn't seem to have a response. Uh, the issue of youth unemployment is a big issue, the issue of obesity. None of these really fall into traditional uh, welfare policy solutions. And so the philanthropists are starting to feel under pressure or, or excited about the opportunity to get involved in doing that in Europe as well. But um, it, it's, it's still you know, noticeably different that um, America is really the one country, uh, one advanced country where you feel that this culture of philanthropy is is part of being successful and you don't feel embarrassed about it, you feel proud to talk about the work you're doing and, 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 and to be visibly seen to be wealthy but giving back. And this trend that you saw that made you want to write the book, can you tell us more about the traits underlying it and then when you started interviewing people who were actively engaged in it, what surprised you, what you saw actually uniting them and not uniting them or differences? Yeah, I mean, I think what's, what's been going on in America in the last 10 or 15 years has been that successful entrepreneurs have wanted to actually apply their entrepreneurial skills to tackling some big social challenges. And I think um, that is turning out to be quite valuable in, in terms of there is a, that they've brought an energy to a whole bunch of, of, of social and environmental problems that maybe the political system was running out of. And so it's, it's given a fresh impetus, um, a willingness to experiment and innovate and to back 
new kinds of social entrepreneurs um, with different who, who are challenging the conventional wisdom and that I think is very much out of the, the entrepreneurial mindset that helped a lot of uh, Silicon Valley and, and other uh, groups of entrepreneurs take on the sort of incumbent business world in the uh, 70s and 80s and so the two things are of, of one uh, and I think they are actually showing after you know, a few hiccups along the way that they can start to do some really innovative things. I mean, I, I, I thought Mike Bloomberg, for example, as mayor of New York, his use of philanthropy to fund experiments that he thought were just too high risk to put straight into the political process. And then once, succeed, once they were successful to, to be able to say, we have a proven model, you the taxpayer should now scale it up. I mean, that model I think is being looked at very widely around the world as a way that um, you know, philanthropists become a kind of risk capital for social innovation. And I think we'll see a lot of things happening Can there. you name other names of models that you think uh are worth studying of people who decided to go in and try to make this social change? Yeah, um, I mean, I'm very interested in, for example, Pierre Omidia, the founder of, of eBay, who has created a foundation uh, that, in fact, he very quickly found he didn't want to do old-style giving. He felt that actually some social challenges are better met through a for-profit company and others are better achieved through... Um, traditional grant making and so his program officers and his foundation are really focused on what's the what's the problem we're trying to solve and how do we best solve it and they're agnostic about whether whether to put equity into a company or to make a grant to a social entrepreneur who's a non-profit and they've now I think given away probably 800 million half of which has gone into for-profit entities and about half into non-profits and they're trying to figure out uh, now how the whole ecosystem of a market works and so you maybe need some non-profit regulators in there that you need to set up or standard setting organizations and you fund those simultaneously with funding the businesses that they will oversee and regulate and that actually then you build a whole market much more quickly and I think if you look at microcredit which was an area which went from being philanthropy to being uh, increasingly driven by for-profit companies um, they learned from some of the mistakes that, was, that were made along that trajectory of growth that you needed to put in place consumer protection agencies and various other groups that there wasn't a for-profit model for, and so you had to fund that as a, as a grant maker. But this very question of should you make grants or should you make investments, which is going to have better results, it's, if I'm right, the heart of your book about applying business principles mm -hmm. to philanthropy and do you think a that that is necessary for effective philanthropy and b do you have any kind of rules of thumb about whether a grant is a better use of money than an investment i mean i think this question of you know how how data driven you should be is a very um difficult one because i think some problems are more suitable to measurement than, than others. And what I do think is clear is that you need to have, before you start, some kind of theory that you, of, of what change will look like if you're successful, uh, that you're going to hold yourself to account against. And that may be more qualitative than quantitative, but, it, but you, should know, you should have some sense of whether you're going in the right direction or not, and a willingness to well, some sense, to some sense that. in advance of markers along the way to know if you're going in the right direction. Yeah, and um, and so I think having a model of change and having a sense of what your role in that is, should be, and, and 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 having a constant dialogue about whether you're achieving what you should be doing is the real challenge. And I think the biggest problem with this whole field of philanthropy is that there is just very little rigorous external analysis of what's going on and so because the media is largely uninterested in it um, the uh, there are no standard metrics for comparing one one organization to another when you say organization what kind of organization? well like whether it be a foundation or a philanthropist or whether it be the organizations that they're funding there are, there is measurement going on but it tends to be kept fairly secret within uh, the, the philanthropist's own uh, records and so forth and so 
you are operating in a world where if someone said to, said to you, I'm interested in, I don't know, the subject of tackling meth addiction somewhere in Oregon or something, you wouldn't actually be able to tell them who the best organization was to invest in um, from public records. It, there, there's no kind of equivalent of the research industry in the stock market. Um, and so you're really down to the philanthropists themselves being willing to embrace rigor and accountability. And I think that's something that hopefully will change over the next few years, that we'll get a lot more transparency. But at the moment, it's a, it could lead to an awful lot of money being wasted in um, ineffective giving because simply there's no information about what works and what doesn't work. And so a lot of money keeps going to reinventing square wheels and not enough money goes to where the real progress is being made. This really surprises me because I thought that Gates was setting the example not only for uh, applying business principles and uh, metrics and measurable targets that had to be met before investment continued, but I thought it was also committed to the kind of transparency that would make exactly this kind of comparison possible. Well, I think Gates is, but Gates is in some sense so far ahead of the field and so much bigger a player that um, it takes a long time to pull everyone along behind him. I think one of the things that's been interesting with the giving pledge, this, this, this pledge that he's, he and Warren Buffett and Melinda Gates launched to get people to publicly sign up to giving away half their wealth during their lifetime. I mean, initially, that was just going to be a, a sign a letter and make a commitment, and then they would have a gathering once a year just to you know, pat each other on the backs. And then that is now gradually becoming a group where billionaire philanthropists actually start to do peer review or at least share ideas with their uh, people who are interested in the same issues. And it's interesting to, as you talk to people around that area just how good they're actually starting to feel about it because they initially thought it would be a difficult process to compare notes and that they, they would be um, reluctant to get into stories of what didn't work and what they learned from failure and so forth. But in fact, they seem to be finding it quite liberating. And so I think that message of you know, people who are interested in similar causes actually at least sharing information, even if they don't necessarily actively collaborate, is, is, is something that could lead to, uh, lead to the start of that more well, a, a, transparent a, environment. A risk of this kind of a rigorous application of business principles to philanthropy is the anecdotal stories I've heard of <clears throat> people who raise money. And it, it, it once was that uh, personal idiosyncrasies had a lot to do with how one could, you know, the, the kind of gamut one ran in order to achieve a donation for one's institution. But now it's this person has given 800 million with the following conditions that are incredibly tricky, it's a structured investment. We have to meet certain targets and goals before the rest of the money will come in. And he or she is running us the way he or she ran the business. And we're not business people, we're not hedge funds, so it's very difficult. Do you actually advocate that and think it results in more effective investments philanthropically? I mean, I think one of the striking things uh, that, that seems to be improving uh, that I noticed when I first started writing about this area was that there is a huge culture clash that business people come towards a non-profit often with a with a view that anyone in the non-profit sector must be a bit of a loser because um, you know essentially they would have gone into business if they hadn't been um, and the people on the non-profit side regard uh, the business people as sort of an evil capitalist who's going to come in and make their life miserable and, and it but the common factor is that there is this money and there is this need to, to work together. And, and so you've, you see often a lot of misunderstanding at first, but I think that organizations, the, 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 the non-profits in particular, are getting better at talking the language of the, of the philanthropist and figuring out how to, you know, how, how to not lock yourself into a bunch of conditions that are inappropriate to your mission because you just want the money. That, that, that I think they're realizing that it's worse to be in that situation than it is to say, no, it takes this is being what we burned. need. And there's a certain, you know, there is a certain element, there's a certain number of the, uh, who I'm very impressed by, the venture philanthropists who are coming in and saying, actually just as in venture capital, we will um, back an individual more than we'll back the business plan because we just believe this person is a winner and they, they understand the world. 
and we're going to give them the capacity to succeed. You're seeing a new wave of, of philanthropy that is doing that, which is much more saying, here's an interesting social entrepreneur, not quite sure about the business model, but I'm going to back them and, and, and take them through, and we're going to plan together on how do we take this into a large-scale organization. And so that isn't so much about really locking people into very precise commitments and plans. It's much more about trying to think through what growth looks like and, and how, how can you build in capacity from day one as you would do with a, with a Silicon Valley startup um, rather than the traditional grant funding which is often very, would regard a lot of what, you, what is capacity building as in fact overhead and therefore something to be avoided. And so um, you know, I, th I think there's a whole different sort of different strands going on and some of which are very positive. So if, if, if one is a beginning philanthropist and I think this is part of your book, you kind of give a, a how-to guide of how mm. to do this. But one thing that underlies uh, the people in your book, and he has you know, marvelous interviews with lots of these philanthropists who have just started this new model, is are you obliged to set down a kind of list of uh, moral imperatives, specific results you want, you, one's own political, even religious ideology that should guide these principles. I mean, what's the beginning uh, worksheet one should assemble before starting to think about how to give away money? I mean, I think the, I mean, the impulse to give is something that's fairly deep in a lot of people. So I'm less, I think there's less to say about that. I think people, the evidence that it makes you feel good, that, that, that in fact, thanks to Bill Gates and others, you know, it, it, there's a sort of role model of this is what success looks like to be involved in philanthropy. All those sorts of things, I think, are leading to more giving and will continue to lead to more giving, um, not just here in the States, but all around the world. I mean, it's striking in China, in Latin America, in Africa now that as people become successful business people, they are quickly turning to philanthropy and actually turning to the American model as, as, as their model. I think the difficult, the, the, where the opportunities come in, I mean, I think once you decide what, uh, that you want to give, it's, it's, it's giving to something that you feel passionate about and that you want to engage in. It's um, becoming very, I mean, very expert in that area and trying to figure out, you know, what is it that you can uniquely bring as a philanthropist to that area? Um, because, you know, today, maybe compared to 100 years ago, the philanthropy, the money that you bring to philanthropy is not going to be able to solve a problem and, unless it is applied really intelligently either to sort of unblocking a bottleneck or find, where there's a tipping point in a system where a little bit of a push can make a big difference. And so it's, it, you do need to really understand the system that you're trying to change and, and have a model of where your money and energy and network can have a a huge difference and I think that's where the lack of transparency in the system is a real problem in that it requires a lot actually a lot more work than it ought to do to be able to figure out the existing model that's that's operating around a particular problem and and and, and how you therefore intervene in that system but I think that's that's what you do and then um, you know I think then a lot of it depends on you know, this is a hard, inevitably a hard process, and so it's having the, the willingness to try things, take risks, uh, fail, learn from your failures. Lots of things that I think have not been traditionally celebrated in philanthropy, uh, which has tended to actually be quite a risk-averse world because people feel they don't want to be seen to be wasting money and failure looks like waste, even though it's not. I'm about to open this for questions, but just that fear, it's as if the new example um, that you rightly celebrate in philanthropic capitalism instills this great anxiety. Oh my goodness, what if I'm going to waste my money? Is there any role anymore for the kind of um, spontaneous, imaginative, slightly loony giving of uh, Peggy Guggenheim, these great eccentrics who simply follow their passions without any kind of rigor in advance about uh, applying business principles? I mean, I think there is. I mean, there's always genius. There's always people that just have something they want to do and it's their money and do what they want with it. I think but if, uh, where I think I see the great opportunity, though, is, is, is that um, you know, our political systems and our non-profits and our business world are all um, struggling with a, 
a growing short-termism, a growing risk aversion, and an awareness that there are these huge problems out there that need to be addressed that they're not really able to tackle. And so there is an opportunity for people who are entrepreneurial, who are willing to take risks, who are willing to dig deep into an area and, and be rigorous about it, to, to maybe try and back some unorthodox ideas. I, I mean, I was talking recently to someone who's involved in a foundation that's been backing uh, out-of-the-box thinking around cancer for the last 30 or 40 years. And there's some people they backed in the early 70s who were doing research into the whether, whether the immune system can actually be harnessed to cure cancer. And it, it's taken until now, really, for that research to suddenly start bearing fruit. And you know, a lot of the, the, the NIH wouldn't back that kind of research because it wasn't in the conventional wisdom. And I think there's a whole range of areas that are now emerging as big problems or big challenges where bringing that out of the box thinking, the risk taking into the, into the system can really disrupt things in a really positive way and may throw up some big unexpected wins. And what, what a great thing to be the philanthropist that helps that happen. So, you know, there's a bit, there's just a very light challenge for all of you to think of meeting. Um, do we have any questions? And I think we're going to wait for the mic. There's the gentleman who will bring it to you. There's the first gentleman with a question. And then could you kindly give the mic to the woman in the front after he's done? Thank, uh, yes, thank you. This is an excellent discussion because uh, transparency, um, and, I, and, and you might mention this in your, in your book, and you probably do, um, but transparency is such a huge issue. What percentage of these major foundations, and let's take the United States, are uh, money that you give is being spent on administration? Well, I mean... The dread overhead? I mean, the, the overhead question is an interesting question because it's, um, as I say, I think a lot of what is often called overhead is in fact spending money on building the organization. And some issues, you need a lot of, I mean, a lot of the money is gonna go on uh, campaigning or, or things that aren't delivering a direct service. And so you wouldn't wanna treat them the same as you would an organization that is basically, should be pushing most of the money out of the door and, and should have low overheads. And so if you look at something like Charity Navigator or GuideStar, which are two organizations that have rated non-profits on their, uh, their finances, they initially, like five or 10 years ago, they were giving a five-star rating to organizations which had very low overheads and a one-star if your overhead was beyond about 30% or something. And I think they've realized that actually they, that, 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 that system of ratings is completely inappropriate because it takes no account of the performance of the, of the organization itself and the impact that you're getting from the spending. And so there's a big push now to try and get something around measuring impact, um, measuring outcomes, and how an organization contributes to that. And this is very difficult work, admittedly. But I think we're in a very similar position to maybe the 1930s when there was a big push around developing economic statistics such as GDP and a big push around financial analysis of businesses which led to, led, us to, led to a move to a lot more rigor in understanding what was going on. And that's now starting to happen in the social or nonprofit sector. Um, so we actually will start to be able to talk much more about value for money in terms of Im units of impact of some kind per expenditure. And I think at that point, the debate about overhead becomes a, a meaningful debate because you can then start to talk about efficiency of organizations. And a big area of growth is going to be, I think, um, pay for performance bonds, which, are, um, which have been pioneered in Britain as social impact bonds and are now taking off over here, which are where the government says, here's a problem like um, re prisoners who are released and then reoffend that cost the taxpayer a lot of money. If you in the private sector can find a solution to that problem, we'll pay you after, after the fact on, on the basis of the results that you create, that, that you get. Um, and that's gonna shift the whole debate, I think, around outcomes and create a whole business of 
figuring out how the private sector, non-profits and capital can work together to meet specific challenges that government sets around outcome. And that will be, I think, a huge boost to trying to measure impact in a, in a way that, that makes some um, financial sense as well as uh, you know, just bit, rather than just the sort of narratives that we have at the moment, which are very hand wavy. <laughs> Valerie Kahn. So as we've seen uh, either leveling off or decreases in American federal uh, research dollars, particularly in physical sciences, but even in biological sciences, so those of us working in basic and translational science space have had to lean more and more on philanthropists to come in and fill the funding gap. Are you seeing um, any trends in the philanthropists you've talked to about their inclination to fund things that had been traditionally more in the government's sphere? Um, I mean, I think that there, there are some interesting trends. I was at this event last week in London, um, which was around the issue of dementia and finding cures there. And the example of Brain Canada was, was, was raised a lot, which is that the government has put up a matching fund that it will match private philanthropy. And the private philanthropy uh, funds research in that particular area and the government will just match whatever they put into that area up to a, a limit of I think initially 100 million or something. But it's a model that seems to have generated a lot of enthusiasm from the philanthropists there to invest in stuff that might have traditionally been seen as a government responsibility. And so I think it's, you know, whereas if you'd gone back 10 years ago, you would have said something like autism, um, a lot of hedge fund guys are investing in really out of the box stuff from on autism, but the, the, some of the key, the core research is not getting funded by the government and they weren't picking up the stuff that government was leaving. This kind of matching fund approach is sort of maybe a way to kind of provide a little bit of leadership from uh, the mainstream, but also getting, harnessing the, the philanthropic and energy and money. Presumably the idea of venture philanthropy means that there's a kind of imaginative risk taking allowed in just this kind of research that the NIH won't fund or the kind of immunogenic cancer research you were describing before. Mm. So it, it is geared to looking for alternatives that are not being otherwise funded. But, there, but I think there is a genuine worry that philanthropists have that, that the, the, simply the awareness of their deep pockets is going to mean government backs off from a whole bunch of things the government ought to be doing in the hope that the philanthropy will pick it up. And I think no one wants to be uh, in that position. And so finding more creative ways of partnering up between government and, and, the, and the philanthropic world is, is more important, I think. It holds government to task. Hi, Cynthia schumann ottinger from the Aspen Institute. And I just had a comment on transparency. I wanted to mention that the Aspen Institute is leading a major nonprofit transparency project called the Nonprofit Data Project. We're trying to get the government to make tax forms on nonprofits more accessible to the public so we can do analyses, understand the trends much more easily. We have done a report called Liberating Nonprofit Sector Data, which we have available on our website. Oh, thank you for that. And I think, I mean, it's just, it's just hugely important work because I do think so much money is going to flow into that sector over the next 10 or 20 years. And, you know, my bet would be that without data, a lot of that money is going to go to waste. Whereas with data, we can really start to back the, the best ideas and kill off the bad ones. That is the idea. The lady in the back. Thank you. I have a question around corporate philanthropy, especially the corporate philanthropy that sort of flow through, it's not endowment. And companies fund in areas that have some residual connection to what they do. And when you're talking about some of this risk taking, that might be an interesting way to do some more extreme, almost beginning R&D. But you get down that slippery slope of arm's length. So where do you see corporate philanthropy in this role of using philanthropy to do some very new things in social innovation, what is the role of the company in their pot of money? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a very, very confusing area at the moment. And, and I will just focus on public companies because I think a lot of private companies, there's a lot, of, a lot more variability in what's going on. But the mainstream corporates have gone from 
doing foundation work that was often investing, just, just giving money to local community organizations around the headquarters or uh, the chairman's wife's favorite opera or whatever, to something where they feel some pressure from shareholders to justify what they're doing in terms of, of a return. And that's led to a very confused response in terms of, well, do we just shut it down? Do we, um, do we pick an issue that's core to our mission as a company? Or do we just hand it over to the crowd, fund it through the employees so they choose what the money goes to? And there's a lot of experimentation going on, um, some of which you know, I think is actually more risk averse because they feel they're being scrutinized and if, if money is wasted, you know, quotes wasted, they will be criticized for it. But I think, you know, where I find the really interesting stuff going on is companies like Unilever uh, out of Britain and Holland, which is... I knew you were going to get to a British example. Uh, I mean, they are really embedding working with non-profits as, as core to their corporate vision of doubling their sales in the, non, in the developing world, whilst also tan, demonstrably improving the lives of the people who they're helping. And it's the most ambitious statement by a public company that I've come across, and they're putting serious money behind it. Now, they had four, the chairman there, Paul Polman, who started this, has had four years of very good profits in the first four years of pursuing this plan. The last year, the profits weren't going so well, the share price was flat and he's already feeling pressure from shareholders to justify what he's doing in year five. And so it's very early days to see whether this kind of um, bold corporate you know, mission stroke philanthropy is really going to take hold. But I think there's, certainly if you talk to most CEOs of big companies nowadays, they are very concerned about recruiting uh, millennials into the company. And, and it seems like there is something about the millennial worker that they want their company to do something they can believe in beyond just making money and that, and that they will ask tough questions of, of the company. And so maybe that is a sort of, that is going to be a quite a powerful force over the next 10 or 15 years of, of making companies um, think more seriously and thoughtfully about, about their mission. Um, I think I'll, sorry, okay. Uh, this is going to be our last question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you alluded to the concept that in the business world, whether you're VC, whether it's VCs or big investors on Wall Street, you know, there's a lot of uh, effort undertaken in terms of quantitative and qualitative research into prospective investments. Uh, in, in, what's your sense in, you know, in, this, in these worlds of funders, how rigorous their due diligence is when they're checking out leadership, when they're really um, probing where they're spending their money? Well, I think Again, there's a range of, of seriousness, but I think there has been, I, I think most funders, most of the big funders are now relatively rigorous in their due diligence, but that they are largely keeping that information to themselves. And there is an initiative afoot at the moment led by some of the um, high net worth investment bank man, uh, organizations to try and persuade the 50 biggest foundations to share their due diligence uh, with them so that their high net worth clients who want to give in a particular area can actually draw on the work that's been done by the foundation, which is otherwise just sitting in a pile gathering dust. And I think that would be, if, that, if, that, if, if the foundations are willing to participate in that and that and the, a way can be come up with the, that it's not just favoring one institution uh, in the banking world. Um, that that would be the start of quite an interesting marketplace for good that would have a lot of, a lot more, uh, you know, hard, rigorous data, and and then we can really start to, uh, you know, to see I think a lot of a lot more confidence that when you give your money is going to go somewhere where it really makes a difference, and I think that for many people is the is the final reservation they have and the thing that's holding them back from giving on a much larger scale, and so. I think, again, it comes back to this data point. If we can get the, the ecosystem of data and of learning about what works and what doesn't work to be much more transparent and lively, then I think a lot more people will feel they want to get involved and, 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 and know that they can feel excited about their potential to make a big difference, which I really do think we're going to see happen over the next 10 years. I think it's going to be a real golden age of philanthropy, and uh, America will be leading the way in that. And the way to understand how to achieve this and how to prod companies and individuals to is to buy a philanthropic capitalism and well, scrutinize it as I hope you all will. Thank you very much, Matthew Bishop. Thank you.